few years ago we started hearing about these exciting new newly found megaliths at Gornea Shoria and then for a long time, maybe some three years, there was no new update at all, just all those old pictures brought by Sidorov and um, people didn't even know where is the actual locations, we were not given any coordinates even. But now finally we have an update. In 2016, Vadim Chernobrov organized a new expedition to Gorne Shoria and uh, currently, actually Vadim Chernobrov is uh, surely the most famous and most respected alternative uh, researcher in Russia. As of today, just a couple of months ago, the situation was different, Andrei Sklarov was uh, still alive, but unfortunately he suffered untimely death, although he wasn't particularly sick, all of a sudden he died at his home without any warning. Well, that seems to be happening often to people who inquire too much. But let's get back to Gorne Shoria. In this video, I'm simply gonna give you the gist, just the most uh, important and interesting information out of uh, some two and a half hours long talk given by Vadim Chernobrov. So the first one hour, the first half of the talk was uh, quite different, at least for me, from the second half, because in the first half he was explaining in detail how all these uh, alleged megalith is a completely natural formation. He saw it um, as a remains of a very old volcano. And the main point in the first half of his presentation was that um, all these regularly shaped blocks which make many people think that the Gorna Yashoria are actually very ancient megaliths According to him, they are so regularly shaped just because the structure of the stone, the natural stone is like this, that it tends to crack at right angles and form such regularly shaped blocks. Now, this video is just a follow-up on my previous videos about the Meltalids. If you haven't watched those, what you're gonna hear now will make little sense actually because here he is not showing so much those uh, places that look like megalithic structure he tends to concentrate on places that don't look much in that way or at least that was his approach in the first half of his talk the second half was radically different well, since different specialists have uh, seen the site and have different opinions, let's assume for now that um, the cracking of the stones is a tricky matter and cannot give us an answer as of the artificial or natural origin of these um, structures. And then after assuring us for one hour that this is an old volcano and it is completely natural from all sides and angles and perspectives, he started speaking in a completely different manner. He said, although it's a completely natural geological feature, I can't deny that some aspects seem to have been touched by intelligent design. So then, first of all, he mentioned that first he said one spot, then he said at least one spot or maybe more. They noticed something like a binding material, a mortar, something like this in between the stones and they took a sample which later on in the laboratory showed uh, unclear results. As of its origin, is it uh, just some uh, natural substance that got stuck between the stones and then petrified? Or was it really some sort of mortar? That's not clear. And um, this is the only image, the only couple of images <coughs> that he provided about uh, 
at this particular point. Well, he seems to be particularly generous nowadays because the expedition was less than a year ago and we have uh, colorful photographs shown online. Usually it takes five years before he publishes any results and that would be usually without photographs or the photographs will be two by three centimeters and you can't see anything. I don't know why he has that uh, policy of uh, publicity, but that's how it is. And uh, he's the leader of the biggest alternative research organization in Russia. Also, they have international branches. They really organize very well equipped expeditions many times per year. They do really serious work, but in terms of uh, publishing the results, that's that scares. And then towards the very end of his talk, he mentioned something extremely interesting. One particular spot, according to his words, didn't look uh, very natural in its uh, origins. I'm gonna show you all the photographs uh, he gave of this place. This is uh, one of them. So the thing is that um, below this protruding stone there is a very regularly shaped kind of uh, entrance looking thing that is um, filled up according to his words with the polygonal masonry. Just to get idea of the scale, I think right in the middle of the screen you see small white things. Those are those ants are some members of his expedition, I believe. So it's quite a big entrance. Uh, as far as I understood, it is smaller at the top where you can see them and below it would reach some 40 meters of width. But that below is uh, hidden in uh, dense vegetation and uh, he said it's very hard to photograph. So basically, he said, it looks like some sort of a gigantic blocked door. Now, the stones were too big for them to move. They tried to insert cams on sticks or do whatever scanning was possible, but they couldn't find any cavities with their scanning. But on the other hand, he himself admits that uh, the stones that block it could be simply too dense to allow any scanning to see what's behind, or if there is any cavity, it could be even completely blocked. Or I would add from myself as well, uh, or maybe there is no cavity, no tunnel, no entrance. Maybe it's uh, one of those gates that uh, look closed to us, like a marumeru. But they may not be closed in astral sense for those who know how to use them. And um, also in the last section of the talk, when he was answering questions, somebody asked if uh, they have seen stones with a different composition laying next to each other in this uh, polygonal work. And he definitely said yes. They definitely looked as if they have been brought from somewhere else and in the stones that were forming the polygonal masonry blocking the alleged entrance there were stones of different composition laying next to each other now that's a very important point i don't know why is he not showing photographs about this particular point, but at least he mentioned it when somebody asked. So what conclusion can we make from this new information about the full 
class of sites like this. I call them melterids. Well, my conclusion is that we are back to asking the same question. What are they? Because again and again we see the same situation. Naturally looking stone formations and within them woven things that don't really look natural. Maybe that doesn't come very strong across from these particular photographs but it does come across from what he says and it's clearly visible on the photographs of other meltlets in the region. And then to illustrate his point that sometimes natural formations can look as if they were man-made, Vadim Chunrobrov opened the topic about Yonaguni. Now, according to him, Yonaguni is a fully natural formation and he is convinced about it because of the first-hand report received from a Russian diver who explored the site himself. Now, I find his uh, conclusions to be very hastily done. Some important points about Yonaguni were not even mentioned when he was presenting his view, but uh, I'm getting more and more the impression that uh, this is his style of presenting information. He tries to look as much skeptical as possible. I don't know if uh, that's his own understanding his own perspective or he thinks this is the right way to present it to the public which he expects to be mostly skeptical nowadays. Yonaguni is relatively easily accessible at least compared to Gorna Ashoria. Anybody can go and dive. There are a couple of uh, divers centers on the island and they offer boats every day, departing every day. It's not an extremely easy dive spot, but you don't need to be a professional or to have practice, prior practice in diving if you really want to see it for yourself. Well, Gornea Shoria remains almost inaccessible. There is no road to it. And so, for now, we can only rely on the images of those who organize expeditions. But I hope that in the very near future there will be more and more of that because now the coordinates are published and uh, there are many Russian people who are interested in it and uh, I'm sure some of them will be going there to see it for themselves and uh, they will publish more images and information about this interesting place. And then Vadim Chernobrov made yet another point about uh, Yonaguni that I very strongly agree with. Many people dive at Yonaguni all the time. Some of them think it's a natural creation, others see it as an intelligently designed ruin. But despite this uncertainty, it continues to be the most famous site. It gets all the spotlights when it comes to traces of ancient advanced civilizations on the territory of nowadays Japan. While at the same time, megalithic structures of unexplained origin, which are surely man-made creations, get no attention whatsoever, just no research, nothing. Actually, many of them are even covered, the entire sites are closed and we don't even have photos of them because there is no access. Yet others could lay out there in the forest just like that in the open and nobody will know about it because the locals don't seem to have any particular interest in them. For example, the people in the neighborhood near this forest when this one is located they don't know anything about it. They don't even seem to want to know more. 
Nobody is searching for possible other parts of this structure, although it's somewhat logical to assume that it is not just one part laying out there. That was the situation as reported by Andrei Sklarov when he visited a few years ago. The Japanese people definitely tend to show religious reverence and respect to such strange-looking stones. But as far as deep inquiries and real historic research about what kind of races did inhabit their island before their Asian race settled over there, that is not very actively pursued. Currently, we, the human race, suffer from a remarkable forgetfulness about our ancient past, glorious ancient past. And in one sense, this is a totally self-imposed situation. Although our history has been stolen by fraud from us, we have allowed it to happen. And how exactly? By fostering ideas that are against the universal goodness and making them an accepted norm in our society. Getting back to the example with history, for example, this is the idea that history should be viewed from the perspective of what is best for my country or my race. History should be studied and presented in a way that it will favor my community, make it look better than others. Gradually, most people start accepting them as irrefutable and self-evident reality, these ideas. In their turn, they are supported by other equally questionable ideas, like, for example, the concept of patriotism. Predecessor of the current concept of patriotism was the noble feeling of love towards the earth that you are born on, feeling that this land is sacred and it should be preserved, its natural beauty being worthy of worship. This originally noble feeling has devolved into the ugly concept nowadays that It is some sort of good thing to go to other lands and ravish them with war, trash them, and all this is in the name of the prosperity of your own land? Although history has shown again and again your own patch of land, your own small patch of land, and you yourself would have done much better if you wouldn't have gone to war. People don't learn these lessons, and they continue sticking to these perverted ideas of patriotism and the various other perverted ideas that sprout from them. Like, for example, when it comes to history, I should avoid mentioning interactions with other tribes, with other races. It should be only us, always on this land. We never learned anything from anybody else. We are the greatest. Blended by this type of beliefs, People are so lazy that they refuse to even see the obvious, what is obvious from the numerous artifacts, that in the past people, the different races of people were interacting with each other much more actively. They were learning from each other. It's not that those bad people came just to teach you and tell you what to do. No, you were, they were learning things from you and you were learning things from them. There was cultural exchange, a lot of it, and not only with other races of people, also interaction with other races of beings, many of whom were far wiser than us. Because we are so lazy, we prefer to live in a tiny small matchbox of reality to the extent that when some people interact with other races, even now, even when there are plenty of witnesses giving testimony about such meetings, not in the past, but in the present, still people simply say, of course this could not have happened, or it shouldn't have happened, or I'm just simply not interested. And those who are interested in coming out of the matchbox, the first step is to realize that it will not happen by waiting for humanity to evolve and come out of the kindergarten. 
If you wait for that, you are not likely to reach anywhere soon, because humanity in general seems to get more and more childish by the day. Just look at the stupid war around, at the pollution. But you were born in a human body, and with that body come the universal rights that some people are not aware of. You always have the right and the power to go astray from the herd. And the only thing needed to come out of the matchbox is your firm resolution, your firm determination to upgrade your belief system, your software, and to tune it into the belief system of universal goodness, to substitute the belief system that has been given to you by your parents. Once your personal guardian angels notice that finally you show interest in the universal values of goodness, they will be more than happy to help you. And what exactly are these universal values and belief system of goodness is best to learn from your guardian angels direct because religious scriptures are often edited by men or we get interpretations only or translations of something old and misunderstood. And please don't worry that if you devote too much time in connecting to your angels, your earthly matters, the practical things that happen in your life will be neglected, or will go wrong, or you will not fulfill your duties to the family, or whatever. It's just the opposite. Miracles were not happening only in biblical times. Biblical-style miracles happen to ordinary people even nowadays. You can hear and see the sincere stories told by people just like you and me, for example, here on YouTube. And as we start to develop our angelic qualities, the doors of all kinds of knowledge and wisdom will open in front of us automatically. And the knowledge of the true history of the human races will be only just a small portion of all.